All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Saturday again, everybody. Round two coverage of the NBA playoffs here at Hoops Tonight is brought to you by Chase Freedom Unlimited. How do you cash back? All right, we're just going to be hitting the Miami Heat with an impressive Game 3 victory over the New York Knicks in this video. Some of the adjustments that I expect moving forward and some of the things that I thought were interesting from this game. Also, if you guys missed it, Earlier today, I did a little over 30 minutes on the two games from last night, talking about Nuggets, Suns, and he uh, and Celtics Sixers. You guys can find that a little bit further back on the feed. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to the Volumes YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT so you guys don't miss any show announcements. And if for whatever reason you guys miss one of these videos and you can't get back over to YouTube to finish, don't forget you can find them wherever you get your podcasts under Hoops. Tonight. All right, let's talk some basketball. So, you know, this series to me is really coming down to the matchup between the stars on both sides. Um, I've talked about this with the Knicks in particular all ser- all season long, and I also think it's the specific reason why the Heat are rising the way that they have been as of late. Um, I talked at many points in the season when the Knicks would go on a winning streak and then they'd go on a losing streak and then they'd go on a winning streak. Whenever I would discuss the team, I'd commonly associate their ceiling with what Julius Randle and Jalen Brunson can do because they have a lot of other the a lot of other fundamental cogs that you like for a long run like a, a team that's capable of making a long playoff run right like they've got excellent home court advantage they've got excellent head coach they've got good guards that can play on both ends of the floor they've got some wing athleticism they've got a good backup center they've got in my opinion better shooting than they get credit for less about shooting more about overall aggregate offensive skill they're a good team attacking closeouts um <clears throat> they've got they cross a lot of boxes and in theory their stars are capable of being everything you need from that position as well like a dynamic and versatile scoring guard that can succeed in pick and roll in isolation and in the post. Um, I actually would like to see Jalen Brunson post up a little bit more, especially in this Gabe Vincent matchup. And then Julius Randle is my favorite type of big rim pressuring forward that can punish mismatches, especially against a switching team. In theory, it should work out. But once again, Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo, 45 points on 35 shots today. And Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle, 30 points on 35 shots. Basically the difference in the game. And you know, it's funny because this this I I I, uh this series is not completely over, but it's starting to look like I was wrong about this pick again. And it looks like the two picks that I've been most wrong about in this entire entire postseason run are centered around the Miami Heat. And the evidence surrounding these playoff series was my main reason for picking against them. They were pretty damn bad all season long. And then they needed to make a run at the end of the season. In their last 25 games, they were below 500, despite desperately fighting for play-in position. Then they got their ass kicked in their first play-in game. And then in their second play-in game, they were trailing by three late before coming back to beat the Chicago Bulls. So, like, that, that Milwaukee series kind of seemed a little bit, you know, it seemed like an outlier compared to what we've seen. But the big thing that happened in that series that has translated forward is – Bam and Jimmy are just both playing incredible basketball. Bam is a little bit more in his what he's doing on the defensive end. Bam and Abayo absolutely shut down Julius Randle today, and we're going to talk a lot about that here in just a minute. But what he's doing defensively, and then Jimmy just being a superstar shot creator, is going a long way towards completely swinging a dynamic in this series when I genuinely believe the Knicks have a little bit better roster. I mean, it's not exactly a big hot take, there's a lot of undrafted guys. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of bigger names and more talented pedigrees on the New York Knicks roster than there is on the Miami Heat roster. And credit to the guys in that locker room, credit to Eric Spolstra, credit to Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo taking on so much to make small achievable roles for those Miami role players, but like I this has been the team that I've been most wrong about in this playoff run. Again, a lot of basketball to play. But here we are through three games of the second round, and I just had a horrible read on this Miami Heat team. I thought specifically Bam and Jimmy early in the game set the tone getting to spots that they like to get. First two shots that that uh, uh, Miami made in this game were close to the rim, physical, short, pop shots in the lane. One from Jimmy Butler in pick and roll where R.J. Barrett kind of recovered and got back in front of him and he made a little shot over the top. And then Bam at a bio, just get working to his spot against Mitchell Robinson in the lane. He had a lot of success there at the semicircle, charge circle area. Um, against Mitchell Robinson today. They're just they're big physical players that 
feel comfortable in these environments and they get to shots that they like. And then on the other end of the, th- the floor, I really thought Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle played a poor game from the standpoint of decision making. Um, there was a ton of traffic. One of the biggest things that I noticed from a coverage standpoint in this game was it was less about the zone disrupting them and more about the them just completely ignoring Josh Hart. And in the, especially in the early phases of the game, they basically put Max Struess on Josh Hart and had him ignore him. And instead of just trusting Josh Hart to knock down some corner threes, especially early, he ended up attempting some threes later in the game, but especially early in the game, they just, rather than taking what the defense was giving them and giving Josh Hart a chance to build his rhythm with some wide open shots, they just started forcing things, both of them. But uh, uh, um, Jalen Brunson in particular and pick and roll, just kind of getting into a ton of traffic and throwing up garbage at the rim while Josh Hart is open. There was a play where Julius Randle's working against Bam Adebayo on the right block, and 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 Josh Hart is at the wing, and uh, Max Struess just ignores him and hard doubles Julius Randle. And rather than just making the right kick out pass to Josh Hart and at least letting him have an opportunity to take a shot or drive that close out, he ends up settling for a really tough shot. And you know, again, like basketball is 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 a is a very very complicated sport, and it's not as simple as what your skill set is. It's a bunch of different things. It's about how much of a rhythm you're in, how well you're seeing the floor, how what types of decisions you're making. Are you getting good separation when you need to get to your spots? And you know, they're just not doing a very good job right now. And it's been, I think, one of the biggest stories of this series is there. You know, obviously they didn't have Julius Randle in Game One, and um, Jalen Brunson didn't really wasn't involved enough in the offense late in the game. And then game two, what what happened at the end of the game? Against that Miami Heat zone, Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle started to control the game at the end. We talked a lot about the two ways that they attacked their zone at the end of game two. They played well, they win, right? And then they go into game three and they play extremely poorly and they end up finding themselves in a game that they're not even competitive in. Um, but like even then, even as I talk about bad decisions, I do want to credit specifically Jimmy Butler because they left Bam at a bio for the most part in single coverage and Bam did some scoring. But Jimmy Butler was facing a lot of attention as well. We're going to talk about a bunch of the different coverages um, that he saw, but he's just so damn big and strong that he could get a basket even against those coverages. We talked about in that drop coverage first play of the game, he gets R.J. Barrett recovers and walls him off at the rim and he just makes like a little – shot in the lane or they'll uh there was a play where he was posting up Josh Hart on the left elbow and Jalen Brunson just leaves his man and hard doubles Jimmy Butler and in the same way that Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle were struggling with that hard double Jimmy Butler made a superstar shot just a hard dribble to his left step back got plenty of separation rose up and knocked it down there's another play later in the quarter where He's coming off a ball screen, and they try switching. So, hey, we're not succeeding in the drop. We're not succeeding with doubling. Let's try switching. And Julius Randle just picks him up as he's coming off the ball screen, and Jimmy just takes two hard dribbles down into the lane and takes a fadeaway over his left shoulder and makes it. And, again, like I, like in the NBA playoffs, teams are going to try to take the easy stuff away, and there's no doubt that you want to make good decisions and try to give your teammates a chance to make the defense pay for hitting shots. But even as we zoom in just on the tough shots that they took – Jimmy Butler is just better at him. And and if look, here's the thing, like we all knew Jimmy Butler was the best player in the series coming in, but I view I think so highly of of Jalen Brunson in particular, I thought the two of those guys, especially with the lack of shot creation elsewhere on the roster for Miami, I thought they could kind of keep up with him. And they just haven't been able to and 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 that's a significant issue. And even in that game two win, Jimmy Butler obviously is not there. Um uh, but it just goes back to what I said about the Knicks early in the year. The ceiling is as high as those two guys can carry him. And 30 points on 35 shots just is not going to get the job done. Um, so game plan stuff to keep an eye on. Again, Max Truce ignoring Josh Hart. You've got to you've got to make him pay for that. You got to make those kick out passes when they're there. I trust Josh Hart to at the very least attack a closeout and make a play for a teammate. Um, I talked a lot in game two about how I wanted to see the Knicks stop running drop coverage against the Miami Heat guards, and they did not do that. They ran. Drop coverage again. Like they did what I was hoping they would do against Jimmy Butler. They mixed up coverages. They did some drop. They did some switching. They did some double teaming. They did some hedging and recovering. And he just torched it all because he's Jimmy Butler, right? But uh, from an execution standpoint, they just need to be more physical. They need to be much more like uh, when Julius Randle and Jalen Brunson are operating in those spaces, Jimmy and Bam and, and, and Struess and all these guys and Kyle Lowry, they're, they're getting physical on their base. They're bumping them off their spots. They're being super physical because the refs are going to allow it in this environment. And the Knicks need to do a better job of that if they're going to have any chance to slow down Jimmy Butler. 
Uh, but the drop versus the guards, I think, is just completely silly, in my opinion. Like, there was a play in the first half where Max Struess, in pick and roll, uh, the the big man doesn't pick him up in the drop coverage, and Max Struess just goes all the way to the rim and makes a reverse layup. Like, how many guys on the Knicks is Max Struess just going to break down off the dribble and get to the rim on? Probably nobody, right? But if you run a coverage... All he has to do is make a read. And now he's making the read that the rim protector staying with the roll man. Now I have an opportunity to make a layup because my defender's trapped behind me because in the coverage I asked him to chase over the top of the screen. You know, we talked a lot about this after game two, but, you know, these guards, they have guards. You, you work on two different kinds of shots. You work on separation shots and you work on shots that are uh, shots that you have to generate separation and shots when there's natural separation in the coverage, right? So most of these guards will work on pull-up jump shots, hesitation dribbles, different shots in the lane designed as part of like, if I'm in a pick and roll and I find this amount of space that naturally occurs as part of the coverage, that's where I need to hit this shot. And you're giving them access to those shots when their separation moves aren't going to be as effective. There was another play later, uh, later on in the half. Kyle Lowry and Cody Zeller on a pick and roll against Quentin Grimes and Isaiah Hartenstein, right? So if they switch that, is Lowry going to beat Hartenstein off the dribble? Probably not, right? Is uh, Cody Zeller going to go down and uh, uh, just, you know, destroy Quentin Grimes in the post? Probably not, right? But if you run a pick and roll coverage, drop coverage, Kyle Lowry gets over the top of the screen, uh, Quentin Grimes is chasing him, you know, um, uh, Hartenstein steps over into drop coverage to contain Lowry downhill. You've opened up a pocket pass. And now that's just an easy read that Kyle Lowry has made his entire career. He throws the pocket pass. Zeller goes up and dunks it. Like that's just, that's just to me making the game way easier on Miami than it needs to be. I understand not wanting to do switches in specific situations like with Jimmy and Bam because you don't want to give a massive physical advantage to the two best athletes that Miami has on the floor. I, I get that. But it, with how unaggressive Bam Adebayo is as a scorer, like – it, it, and, and we're talking about stretches of the game when Bam was out of the game. Like, wh why are you running the drop against Zeller? Like, that just doesn't make any sense. But throughout the game, regardless of who's out there, Zeller's not going to beat you on switches. Bam Adebayo is not a guy that's like a tunnel vision score. He's very passive, and we've been talking about this for years. So there's no reason to, to, um, to put them in an advantage situation that they don't need. The one guy that I understand doing different types of coverages on is Jimmy Butler. But with these guard screens for the Miami Heat – it needs to be a switch because then at the very least you're forcing limited ball handlers to attack a set defense and have to beat somebody off the dribble. And so I, that's the one thing that I'd like to see uh, a Thibodeau adjust, adjust as we go into game four. Um, so yeah, uh, make better use of heart. Um, be more physical with Jimmy Butler. Uh, stop running drop versus the guards. And then the stars just have to play better. Uh, but game four is the whole season here. And, you know, I, again, I think the Knicks roster is a little bit better. So, that, like, I think it's it's possible. But right now, like, again, I, I've just been wrong about the Miami Heat. Uh, Kevin Love has been an amazing fit. Credit to – I thought um, um, J.J. Redick and Tim Legler did a, a, a show last week that I listened to that I really, really enjoyed because they're two of my favorite basketball minds, and they just got into all the series. And Tim Legler had a really interesting point about – a coach covering for his players' weaknesses. And, and like, that's the thing. Like, Kevin Love has been, you know, considered useless everywhere else he's been. Well, I say everywhere else. It's basically with the Cavs. Like, they didn't really make good use of him, right? And then he gets into Miami, and you think those same limitations, uh, you know, he's not super physical anymore under the rim the way he used to be. He's not a great defensive player. All these things that you would expect uh, um, to be limitations, and Spolster's just made it work. Spolster's just made it work. Um, specifically one thing I'd like to see, uh, uh, Julius Randall do a better job of is what they're doing with, uh, Bam at a bio is they're keeping him attached to Julius Randall and Julius Randall can't shake him. And so I, if you look at all, go look at all Julius Randall shots tonight, like he's not getting away from Bam. And then when he does get away from Bam, he's scoring. You got a bucket on Zeller. Uh, he had a bucket against Kevin Love driving in transition. Like when he gets away from Bam, he's having more success. Uh, offensive rebound, putbacks, that kind of thing. But in his set defense situations against Bam, he's just struggling. And a lot of it is, is like Mitchell Robinson will come up and set a screen and, and Kevin Love is just staying attached to Mitchell Robinson. And then Bam is just pushing through the screen. And 
so I'd like to just see the Knicks set better screens. Like Mitchell Robinson set a screen on Bam, and, and it was like almost no resistance. Bam fights right through. He stays on Julius Randle. There's a play where they had Ju- uh, Jalen Brunson come set a screen for Julius Randle to try to get Gabe Vincent onto Randle. And, and like, you know, Brunson kind of flipped the angle a couple times, and then he just kind of gave up and went away. Like, no, like – Set a good solid screen. Julius rip off of it and take one or two dribbles to drag Gabe Vincent away. Then, like Bam, either has to stay home or if he comes back to you, you have a swing pass over to a great shooter and Jalen Brunson to attack. Right. So, like, I'd set better screens. Try to get Bam out of bio off of uh, um, off of Julius Randle again. Like, there's there's adjustments there to be made, but right now. To this point in the series, Eric Spolstra is coaching circles around Tom Thibodeau, in my opinion. Jimmy Butler is playing circles around Randall and Brunson. Bam at a bio has been magnificent. The 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 Heat guards have basically played the Knicks guards to a draw when they're not as talented. So credit to the Miami Heat, man. They're they're kicking their ass right now. And the Knicks are gonna have their hands full for the rest of the series. All right, guys, that's all I have for right now. We will be back later tonight after Lakers Warriors. 